every time a big new release rolls around, I am once again reminded <laughs> game reviews have some major problems. Problem number one, most reviews are rushed. In a majority of cases, review codes are sent less than a week prior to release. On many occasions, in fact, I've received codes with only like two or three days left before embargo. Two to three days to play through a game, write, record, and edit a review. Yeah, it's less than ideal to say the least. Even with a full week, you basically have to speed run through a game if you are looking to have anywhere near an all-encompassing review. I mean, ideally, I personally want at least like 30 to 50 hours before I feel confident enough that I can talk about all of the important aspects and elements to a game. Let's say I get a review code and it's a full week, seven days prior to the embargo lifting. In this kind of a scenario, my schedule would look something along these lines. I'd spend four to five days playing through the game. So let's say I sit down and play for 12 hours a day. That would be at max 48 to 60 hours. And when we're talking about doing a review for an open world game or an RPG or a live service game, like forget about it, dude. That's barely enough time to run through the main story with some side stuff. And it is definitely not enough time to do and see everything in the game. Okay, so days one through five, that's me playing 12 hours a day from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 60 hours in total. And then you just better hope that that is enough time to make a really informed in-depth review. Come day six, it's time for me to sit down and actually process my experience, like think about the game, rehash all of the systems and mechanics, and then write down all of my thoughts in a single day, and then sit in front of the camera and record what I wrote out about it. And then day seven happens and it's time to edit the review. Now this is typically gonna take between eight to 10 hours minimum. I, I mean, especially if we're talking about like working with 40 plus hours of gameplay footage, going through all of that, searching for examples of everything you were talking about, 12 plus hour edits are not that uncommon for that very reason. It's just a lot of stuff to parse through. Now, my point here isn't to complain about this process. No, it's simply to showcase that yes, even with having an entire week with the game before it releases, even that much time can result in a review that is pretty rushed out just due to the sheer amount of time you really need. A full week in many cases barely cuts it, but again, having a full week that's pretty rare in my experience. I would say in most cases, by the time you get a review code, you're looking at four to five days somewhere in that ballpark. But sometimes, like I mentioned, I've had even less. I've had like two or three days with the code before the embargo lifts. So for all of these reasons, most launch day reviews could more accurately be described as first impressions because the pre-release review process simply does not allow enough time for reviewers to fully think through and digest a game. There is no opportunity. You're playing the game nonstop, then having to immediately form an opinion. You don't really get the time to steep in and really thoroughly think through the game. And even for people not attempting to hit embargo, a lot of times there is a pressure to get out the content while it is still relevant. Even people who get the game on launch day, they will be rushing through their play experience and then rushing to finalize their thoughts just to post it when it's still relevant. But that's only the first problem. Problem number two is that reviews are done in a bubble. Most reviewers, first of all, will only play through the game on a single system, whether that's a particular console or whatever PC they happen to have. And th there's never enough time, as we just mentioned, to do multiple full playthroughs. Like, forget about it. That is never happening. What that ends up meaning is that you only ever see and you only ever experience the game as it runs on the particular system that you're playing on. This impacts your exposure to both bugs as well as technical issues. You may or may not experience them. Once a game releases and there are thousands if not millions of people playing on a wide array of different hardware configurations and different consoles, it is only then that we get a good sense of how good or not the game is on a technical level. But when you're putting together a review, you don't have access to that collective knowledge. There aren't thousands of Reddit threads or Twitter posts showcasing the slew of bugs, glitches, or performance issues that a game might have. So I could sit down with a game and play through it for two weeks straight and maybe I only see like a handful of minor hiccups. And as a result, my impression would be, hey, that wasn't all that bad. Like the game ran pretty well for me. There were only a few bugs and those bugs weren't bad enough to ruin my experience. So I would say from my playtime with it, my hands on in the bubble that I am in, technically the game seems to be in a good place. And then the game releases and it's like, oh my God, look at all of this broken crap. This game is a total complete mess. You just can't know what you don't know. And when you're doing pre-release reviews, 
you don't know what the experience is like for other people. It's also the case that you will miss out on any launch day issues. We're talking things like queue times with overloaded servers or overloaded servers resulting in poor performance for the people who are playing. Things like rubber banding or having interactions take 30 plus seconds before they register or like servers just straight up catching fire and so no one can play for multiple days on end. These could be major problems that you just won't catch. So due to the very nature of reviews being done prior to most people having access to the game and you only having your personal experience to go after, you don't have any of the collective community knowledge that can show you if there are widespread issues or performance issues or tons of bugs that you just don't happen to see. These reviews are done in a bubble and so you, they end up missing out on a lot for that reason. But then there is problem number three and that is that publishers they control the entire review process. Around the time of Starfield's release, for example, this was uh, seemed to be a particular issue. I saw a lot of fuss about the fact that certain reviewers and certain review outlets hadn't gotten keys, and people were acting like this was unusual. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. Every single game release, publishers handpick who gets access to codes. And every single release, there are a lot of people who don't get access because, I mean, of course there is. There's not like some automated system where you check a box that says, yes, I review video games, and then you are instantly forwarded review codes for every single game that your heart desires. No, that's not how it works. Game publishers, many times working with third-party agencies, will handpick who gets review codes. They have always handpicked who gets codes, and they always will because there's no other way, unless they're just like handing out codes to whoever the hell signs up, there is some sort of a vetting process that goes into who is given early access to these games prior to them releasing. Now, there are like key distribution uh, platforms that help facilitate this stuff. Sites like Keymailer and Rainmaker, Lurkit and others, but even those aren't completely automated and guarantee that you will receive keys. They are still, you just sign up for them. It's basically a place to register. And then the publishers, either personally or through those third parties, will pick the ones who get access to those keys. The unfortunate reality is, it's like not the right of every reviewer to get a code for every game prior to launch. Publishers are under no obligation to give out codes to anyone, actually. There are benefits, right? Especially for a company who thinks people will enjoy their game. Positive reviews, after all, they are free marketing. But on the flip side, negative re reviews are, you know, well, not something that uh, they are looking forward to getting, right? So, and while it would be best for consumers and in an ideal world, everyone who wants a review code would get one, that's just not how this works. Pre-release access to games by its very nature is 100% at the whims of the publisher. They choose who gets to play their games early. And because of this, there's a huge side effect and that is that of incentives. To get early access, the publishers have to approve you, basically. Now, assuming the best, most noble of intentions, they will do this so long as they think you're gonna give them a fair review. But assuming the worst of intentions, they'll only give you access if they think you'll give them a positive review, or at the very least, that you will go easy on the game. Now, how individual reviewers navigate this issue, this issue of incentives, it can vary wildly. At the very least, consciously or not, you can certainly imagine how this is gonna potentially affect the review process process and how someone judges a game and then what they express about that game. I'll say personally, I am in the position where running my own channel, I have the luxury of only reviewing games that I am already interested in. I don't have to, nor do I spend time on genres or games that I think I'm not going to like. So as a baseline, I tend to go into reviewing most games, at least with the assumption that there's a good chance I will like it. I'm not wasting my time on things that I have no interest in. I don't have to. But it's also for that reason that if there's a game that I'm looking forward to and I get time with it and there are things I really don't like about it, I am more than happy to lean into those issues because it can be a huge disappointment. But yeah, I'm reviewing games that I'm generally expecting to like. If I don't like them, I will certainly talk about it. I do sometimes get the criticism that a lot of my coverage tends to be positive, but that's just because as a hobby and how I run my channel, I'm just talking about things that I enjoy. And if there are things that I enjoy or think I would enjoy and they let me down, dude, I'll blast it. I'm, you can run through my videos. There's plenty of uh, room for criticism, uh, criticism and I'm more than happy to give it. So the less desirable uh, aspect of this entire process of having to interact with publishers and request keys is why do you or do you not end up getting picked? Was it because they don't think you'll give a fair review? Was it because they don't think you'll give a positive review? 
review? Was it because you made content in the past criticizing the company or some of their prior games? Was it because they once sent you an email and you never responded to it and th that really bothered them, so they blacklisted you? Sounds ridiculous, but this can absolutely happen. Remember, the people handing out keys, they are people, flaws and all, just like the rest of us. People can be petty and it, it, it can definitely happen. And the bottom line is many times you will just never know. It could be any one of those things or none of them at all. Maybe they just decided they were very limited. They were only gonna send out 30 review codes in total and you simply didn't make the cut. I'll tell you, that's happened to me plenty of times. There have been tons of games, even just in the past six months that I've been wanting to cover, wanting to review. I'd reached out numerous times, just never heard anything. It absolutely happens. And it, it could be any of those reasons. It could be none of them, like I said. Those are three of the probably biggest issues that I, I see with video game reviews. The great news is they all have one simple solution, and that is post launch reviews. Post-launch reviews have no time constraints. They're not trying to meet an embargo, so they're not having to speed rush through a game to get it out at the same time as everyone else. The only time constraint here um, could just be like that of the reviewer themselves. If they're, you know, trying to upload one video a week, then maybe that just falls in within some time restraints there. But there's no embargo pressure that, and, and no tight, super enforced timeline that they're trying to uh, complete a review within. They're also not having to do their review in a bubble. They have the time to gather the collective knowledge, to see how things play out at release, and to account for a lot of the widespread issues that other people beyond themselves might be having with the game. And to problem number three, they don't deal with it at all because there is no need for them to interact with the publisher and get approval to get access to the game. They're just playing it post-release like everyone else. They buy the game, they play it, and then they share their opinions. So the way I look at it is like this. We've got two different types of review. Well, there's more, but you know, for argument's sake, we've got the pre-launch embargoed reviews, launch day reviews, and then the post-release reviews. Reviews that come out prior to release should be used more of like first impressions to get the general gist of a game and what that particular reviewer thought of their time with it. But these reviews will never be all-encompassing. They will always be a at least a little rushed and are without question missing out on some pretty important details like how did the launch go and were there any widespread issues that I didn't personally experience. Whereas with post-launch reviews, they can take all of this into account. And for that reason, in, having more time to flesh it out and don't need to chase down publishers to try to get early access. This makes these post-launch reviews way more thorough and uh, way having way less conflict of interest, if, if none at all. Now, this isn't to say that the pre-launch reviews are useless, just that they have some inherent flaws. And I think it's important for you to keep those in mind anytime you watch or read any of those pre-release or on release day embargoed reviews. Personally, when I'm doing any pre-launch coverage for games myself, my goal is pretty simple. I want to inform people about the game. I want to discuss what I think about them with the time that I spent, while also fully acknowledging that until the game launches, we simply won't have the entire picture. But I just hope to, with my coverage and these type of reviews, give some people a useful starting point, basically. But those three problems aside, there is another major issue that both pre and post launch reviews deal with, and that is the rating system. That 10 point scale that you see when a game gets seven, eight, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, um, it's garbage. Actually, mostly useless, frankly, because the why and how different people pick a rating is all over the place. It is so individualized that combining all of these scores with tools like Meta and OpenCritic makes zero sense. But hey, I'm guilty of this myself. Many of us will still look at these aggregate review scores as some sort of reliable general impression of how good or bad a game is. And we really shouldn't. There was a time when the 10 point review scale was broken up into multiple categories with a weighted value based on importance. So for example, it could look something like this. Gameplay would be worth three points. Graphics worth two points visuals, two points, story, two points, and then performance worth one point. And then depending after playing through a game, what a reviewer thought about it, they would give a different to the decimal point score for each one of these categories and then tally it up to see what the total score out of 10 was. Now there's a reason we don't see outlets use this method anymore because it's stupid. It, it is stupid, but it at least provided some sort of a baseline framework for how we go about picking a number as opposed to the common method used today, which for most reviewers really seems to boil down to like, how do I feel about the game? Okay, when I think about the game, what feeling arises? Does it feel like a seven or does it feel like an eight? 
Like, <laughs> what the, that's how it comes across, honestly, when I see most people attribute numbers to games. It's like they're picking numbers out of thin air. Instead of having a framework that sort of makes sense, even if it is stupid to boil a game down to decimal point values per category, like, hey, is the gameplay of Zelda, is it a 2.6 out of 3 or is it a 2.7 out of 3? Like, what are we even talking about? Even though that is very dumb, that at least gave some structure to the process of slapping a number on a game compared to how scattershot it appears to be done today. And then there's the fact that most reviewers only use half of the scale, right? Like rarely, if ever, is a game given below a five. Although it can be argued, and I would agree that most games people find worth reviewing are somewhere between a five out of 10 because every game below five, nobody cares about. Like when I see someone give a AAA game a one out of 10, I'm like, mate, how many games have you played? I don't care how buggy, unfinished, or unoptimized a game is, there ain't a single AAA title released in the past 20 years that is as bad as a one. Have you spent any time on Steam at all? Have you seen the sheer volume of utter garbage that's released every single day? There are so many horrendous games coming out all the time. Those are the one out of tens, not Anthem because it didn't have enough end game or the story wasn't as good as you might expect from Bioware. Sure, you can not like it, but it's definitely not a one out of 10 game. One out of 10 games are released 30 a day on Steam. Like that is the garbage that deserves a one out of 10. But then this raises the other question, which is what do these scales account for? Like what are they scaling against? Are we giving games a rating based on how they compare to all other games in existence? Are we rating them to how they compare to the handful of games we play each year over the past five years, over the past 10 years? Are we giving it a rating depending on the one game that we've played for the past five years? And the answer is all of the above. Every reviewer when giving some point value to a game is using their own personalized scale of comparison, which further makes aggregating these scores completely pointless. And I'm not talking about the fact that like individuals are judging a game based on their own personal taste and preferences. Of course that's happening. That is all reviews are. They are an individual's subjective opinion on a game. Did they like it? Did they not? Why? But on top of that, what I'm talking about is like the database of titles that they're pulling from when they put a rating onto a, a game is different for every single person. So you got someone who's, who might say they might play a game and they're like, okay, this thing is all right, but it's not nearly as good as Path of Exile. So I'm going to give this game a four out of 10. But mind you, Path of Exile is practically the only game they played for 10 years straight. So that is like they're, what they're comparing it against. The TLDR of this, of this is basically to say that the 10 point review scale sucks in particular aggregating scores from different reviewers and then judging a game based on that number it's totally unreliable not only are everyone's tastes different of course but also everyone's scale is different how they are rating it the reasons why they are rating it their reference points at which they're scaling it against how they even use the scale there's just hu such huge variance across the board review scales i would say are only helpful in isolation per reviewer so if you follow one particular reviewer for a long time you will get a sense of how and why they give games the ratings they do. But mashing all of these different 10 point ratings from completely different people who are using these scales completely differently with completely different reference points, mashing all that stuff together, it feels completely worthless. But not only that, it's especially bad with how it directly affects studios and developers. We, we got aggregate scores impacting developers yearly bonuses. Like, hey, if Metacritic isn't above an 8.5 on this game, no Christmas money this year. Or worse yet, this can directly result in layoffs and even entire studios just being shut down. This industry can be pretty brutal with people spending five plus years on a project, having it release, and then having half of the staff fired because it's scored below an 80 on Metacritic. I know job security is practically a fable for most industries, but it does seem especially rough for game developers. The 10 point review score system, it is awful. I think we should throw it away. I actually find the simple binary, I recommend or I don't recommend this game with a short list of reasons why. I find that to be the most helpful, as has been said many times by others when talking about this topic. Your best bet when it comes to trying to figure out like if a game's going to be for you, if you're going to like a game or not, is to just find individual reviewers whose coverage you enjoy and whose tastes tend to align up with your own. And then hopefully their coverage gives you enough of a good overview of the game, its pros and its cons, in order for you to make your own informed decision. Even better, find a few of them, watch stuff, raw footage on uh, Twitch, and then use that conglomerate of information to make informed purchase decisions. So with all of that covered, 
with all of the issues with game reviews and some of the potential solutions, why do reviews? What's the point of reviews? Well, there's definitely something very helpful there. Like why I personally make reviews is I want to just create stuff that is useful and helpful to people. I really do try to focus on providing a detailed overview of what a game is, what are its systems, its mechanics, the content, what's the gameplay loop like, with the hope that I can paint a pretty clear picture of, hey, this is the game, and then add my general impressions, what I liked and what I didn't. And hopefully this lets people decide if that game with all of that stuff in mind is going to be something that they might enjoy. Especially when it comes to any of my pre-release coverage, my goal is to just make something that's informative and hopefully can provide a little bit of some early helpful guidance for people. Also, I review because I enjoy it, kind of. It's actually sort of a love-hate relationship, especially when it comes to trying to hit embargoes. Rushing through a play experience can definitely suck some of the fun out of it. There's no question about it. And I don't always love that I don't really have enough time to ruminate and really think over my play experience. Maybe it's just a cognitive flaw with me personally, but I feel like I need a couple of weeks to really play through and really think about a game before I can be super coherent with my thoughts on it. Again, could be a personal issue. Wouldn't be too surprised. So I'll wrap up by saying this. Pre-release reviews cannot and will not ever paint the entire picture, but they definitely have a use. They act as a starting point from the perspective of the individual reviewer. They are often at least a little rushed. They are made in a bubble and can miss widespread issues that they didn't personally experience. And that they do have to go through that process of getting approval from publishers to gain access. Unless there are major changes to this process, you should expect pre-release reviews to always have these issues while I still enjoy making this content myself, I am well aware of its problems because I've been doing it for long enough. I hope to start doing more post-launch reviews in the future because I would like to have more cohesive, fully thought out looks at games, but I do still enjoy doing pre-release reviews. But boy, they have a lot of issues and hopefully I've done a good job of explaining some of them to you here today. That is going to do it for this video. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.